thank you very much for coming. As I said before, I'm a, a, a writer and a video producer uh, with a magazine called Reason Magazine in Washington, D.C. You can check out more about that at reason.com. Um, so for the next 30 minutes, uh, we're going to go through the full history of a country. Uh, necessarily, that does mean we're going to have to lie a couple things, but I'll try to hit the highlights. Um, first, uh, the most obvious question is, why should you care about this country? Why Cuba? It's one of uh, over a couple dozen Latin American countries. It has a population of 11 million people. Its economy is extremely small, uh, well outside of the top 150. Why is it then that Cuba, specifically in the course of the last 60 years of American history, has had such a profoundly important role to play? Well, uh, that stems from this. So this is the Berlin Wall coming down in 1989. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately at risk of reminding myself of my age and mortality and the fact that I'm largely antiquated now in the American economy. But you guys are all born in the late 90s or early 2000s, right? So. Uh, all you guys have ever known is a world order in which the one that you guys are living in is the dominant paradigm. So kind of Western democratic capitalism. But there was many, many, many decades uh, in the middle of the 20th century in which that wasn't the case. That there was American capitalism, and then on the other side, there was a completely different economic system, which is sort of Soviet communism. Uh, and instead of having sort of a vibrant private enterprise, you have the vast majority of the economy being controlled by central planners. You have pretty strict controls on political rights. You can't freely assemble, you can't freely speak, but all those controls are for the purpose of advancing the kind of collective good that the Soviet, and the Soviet uh, experiment was uh, sort of attempting to achieve. This is the flag of the Soviet Union. And for a couple of interesting historical reasons, this uh, competition between these two different conceptions of how is it that you should run a society. Should you have lots of central control, we have a few people with a lot of power making the decisions about what the economy produces, and you have tight controls on what people can say and how they can interact, or do you have the American system, which is, relatively speaking, freer, much more vibrant private enterprise, and a more emasculated central controls. And this competition ended up finding it's a, an extreme focal point in Cuba, that Cuba turned out to be the grounds for this struggle that is in a couple key periods of American history. So this picture was taken in the late 1950s. <clears throat> On the left is Fidel Castro, who is still alive today. Uh, he is right about to finish toppling the dictatorship uh, that was backed by the CIA, CIA by a uh, guy by the name of uh, Fulgencio Batista. He's 32 years old. He's about to topple a dictatorship. I am 32 years old. I spent most of this morning like frantically reshuffling my fantasy football team. So I am, I'm, I'm duly impressed by his accomplishments. He's an immensely charismatic guy, and he has a, a set of skills which makes him capable of kind of operating uh, in the world of the mind, but also in the world of action. He's a gorilla, but he's also like a self-styled kind of poet and intellectual. So on his right, on his right, is uh, the Argentinian guerrilla revolutionary Che Guevara. Uh, we'll get to uh, some more specific details about him a little bit later on, about kind of what he ended up doing with his career after he toppled the Cuban government. But you guys might know him from things like this, that kind of beautifully angular face, that, that visage, visage being uh, 
very easily translatable to posters for some call for social justice or for revolution. Also on bobbleheads. And JC, too. Uh, che Guevara's face, it's never quite clear what exactly it stands for, but we, I think we could all agree it's something about toppling corporate overlords and uh, ridding the world of the cancer that is capitalism. I don't think Jay-Z fully appreciates that he is a corporate overlord and represents <laughs> capitalism. But we'll get to some of the, the interesting inconsistencies in the way that his uh, iconography is deployed a little bit later on. So uh, they toppled this regime that was backed by the United States in 1959. The United States was engaging in a practice that it tended to do quite a bit throughout the middle of the 20th century, which is backing bloodthirsty, terrible dictatorships just so long as they could prevent a country from becoming communist. It's extremely important to the CIA and the American intelligence apparatus not to have communism spread. And uh, almost immediately upon Fidel taking power, he represents something very powerful and very romantic to intellectuals and political activists and sort of left-leaning political types of all varieties, but particularly in the United States. Um, and he uh, is a socialist. He, the, the country ends up providing really expansive government services it's a single party state. There are like elections, but there's there are elections like the way there were elections in Iraq where like there's a reason he gets 99% of the vote because if you don't give him the vote, you're very likely to end up in jail. And also equally importantly, and again, this is kind of where you guys gotta put your mind as you try to appreciate what it is that Cuba represents. He represents like a singular self-determination, like a Latin American self-determination in which this guy from this tiny country was able to stand up to the great capitalist, oftentimes imperialist power of the United States. And that's what he represents, small countries throwing off the yoke of American, sometimes oppression, sometimes intervention. Uh, then also, almost immediately, because Cuba is just about 90 miles off the coast of Florida, in order to survive and get political protection and financial resources, he aligns himself uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, that's the key to Khrushchev right there, who at the time is the head of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union ends up providing Cuba hundreds of billions of dollars over the next couple of decades. Uh, and as a result of this alignment, there's a bunch of very famous uh, conflicts that occur in Cuba, including the Bay of, Pig op Bay of Pigs operation, which JFK attempts to finance some guerrillas to go and topple the Castro regime, that goes uh, terribly. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, the guy that put a bullet in Kennedy's brain, we know traveled and potentially trained in Cuba. We don't quite know, but he was in Cuba. Um, and then, of course, there's the Soviet missile crisis in which the Soviet Union stations nuclear weapons 90 miles off the coast of Florida, and humanity ends up becoming very awkwardly close to annihilating itself if it weren't for some very kind of late, late minute uh, diplomatic heroics from the Kennedy administration. And uh, ever since then, the, Cuba has retained this sacred space in the, the, the minds of a lot of the American left. Um, this is the revolutionary plaza. There's lots of revolutionary plazas in various kind of Soviet affiliated countries. That's Che Guevara, right there. And underneath him, in English it says, until the final victory. I mean, just, you see that and you, even if you don't quite know what it stands for, you kind of, you do feel inspired to do something. We're not quite sure yet, but it's to do something. Um, uh, various like Hollywood types and uh, kind of public intellectuals have gone and uh, interacted with Fidel Castro, befriended him. That's Oliver Stone, potentially the most overrated filmmaker of all time. Uh, this is The Nation magazine, is doing a cultural exchange cruise with Cuba uh, in January of next year. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of like image of what Cuba is. 
Now let's talk about what is actually going on there. And I think that is best summed up in this. So every year, this is still about 20,000 Cubans try to make boats from uh, various bits and pieces, tires, kitchen equipment, and they hop on those in the oftentimes futile hope that they can make it to Florida. And this is the only way that they can escape. They literally, and they know this, risk getting eaten by sharks to get to Florida of all places, right? And those that can't escape like this resort to more drastic means. Cuba actually has the highest uh, per capita suicide rate in the Western Hemisphere. So what is happening here? Wait a minute. This is, these two things are a little bit uh, misaligned. Well, the truth is that kind of underneath all that undeniably kind of romantic slogan narrative about Cuba, it is uh, a police state. That average Cubans are extremely tightly controlled and denied a lot of the freedoms that we tend to take for granted here. There's something called the Department of Revolutionary Orientation, like the most unimaginably just like scary name for a government agency you can imagine, which is able to lock people up for prison terms for being insufficiently deferential to the regime, or being critical of Fidel Castro, or speaking out or forming dissident movements. And that journalists and dissidents and anyone who dares to engage in political opposition, they're regularly thrown into jail. So in 2012, uh, Cuba had about 6,600 political detentions, which is the highest per capita rate in the world of political detentions, people serving jail time because of what they believe. You can take as a paradigmatic example, this guy, Bilar Mendoza, who was detained in 2011 for peacefully demonstrating the human rights abuses of the Cuban regime. After an hour-long trial, uh, he was sentenced to four years for contempt. Again, this is like Department of Revolutionary Orientation, kind of vague accusations of being insufficiently revolutionary, and insulting national symbols. And he eventually died in jail on, a, uh, on the 51st day of a hunger strike, protesting this like abominable human rights violation. The Cuban people have resorted to this to get information about the outside world. It's called El Paquet, which stands for the packet. Uh, internet use is severely restricted, um, but because ultimately the enemy of any totalitarian state or any state that is soaked in religious sounding ideology is information, just what is the truth about our plight. And so what's arrived, uh, sorry, what's arisen is this very complex network of hand delivered internet in which they download uh, movies and music and like friends episodes and phone apps and newspaper articles, and they deliver them on a weekly basis for like a dollar or two. And so it's like hand-delivered internet that people are kind of resorting to to try to get some information that's not tightly controlled by the central powers. Now all that is bad enough, right? Like that's not a really chill place to live to have to resort to USB uh, to, to get uh, yeah, new episodes of Mr. Robot. But to make it even worse, the Cuban economy is uh, subpar, I think is the way to put it. So that right there is not an antique car show. That's like right now in downtown Havana. And because of, to a small extent, the American embargo on uh, Cuba, which really tightly controls economic activity between the island and the United States, but in large part because of the radical inefficiencies and waste and fraud and abuse inherent to top-down collectivist economies, the Cuban people are extremely poor. And they have to stick with 1950s Ford Model A's in order to get around in the year 2015. Uh, Cuba, almost immediately upon Fidel taking over power, suffered acute food shortages and rationing. And it's been that way ever since. 
They also have a somewhat kind of much vaunted universal health care system that's oftentimes compared to the United States's, which is, just as a side note, a form of catastrophe. But uh, despite sort of the romantic claims about Cuba being this kind of humane socialist country that ensures everybody receives the medical care they need, uh, Cuban patients routinely have to bring drugs and their own devices to their doctors. They're technically insured, they're technically receiving medical care, but they're not actually when they show up to the doctor's office. Um, the very, and that sad reality found its most acute manifestation in this, which is that uh, when Fidel Castro himself, after he had three botched operations for colorectal surgery in Havana with Cuban doctors, he had the luxury of fleeing to Spain for a proper surgi uh, surgical intervention. The vast majority of Cubans do not have that uh, luxury. And, uh, but there is still a way that, despite being ostensibly an anti-capitalist organization, or anti-capitalist enterprise, Cuba has like a remarkably savvy marketing department in which they're able to sort of twist and turn and uh, obfuscate some of these key details about the, the nature of the country. So and during the Ebola outbreak of 2014, um, Cuba actually sent a fleet of doctors to West Africa. And it's part of this sort of long-standing program of theirs called Medical Diplomacy, in which they prove the fruits of the revolution by sending the revolution's most trusted warriors, which are these most of <coughs> Cuban doctors. And Fidel Castro himself called it the greatest example of solidarity a human being can offer. And that line was sort of dutifully lapped up by the American media, why Cuba is so good at fighting Ebola. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is actually a classic example of kind of a cynically corrupt money grab being dressed up in the romantic slogan slogans of the revolution. That it turns out that these doctors had their passports compensated the second that they stepped outside of the plane in West Africa. They were held under constant surveillance. The Cuban government was paid directly for their services with the expectation that they would compensate them. They didn't, and the Cuban government ended up pocketing about $8 billion in compensation for the services uh, discharged by their physicians. So all of this is to say that there is a yawning chasm between the romantic imagery surrounding Cuba and its lived reality which is why you get it back. What about that guy? What about Che? Handsome, very hard worker by all accounts, reasonably good military strategist, really has become like the go-to kind of socialist heart drop that can represent the need to kind of overthrow the tools of capitalist oppression. Got this shirt. You even can buy a Che Guevara poster at Urban Outfitters, you could briefly. I guess they, they might have sold out quickly. Um, the truth is that Che Guevara was a, uh, a bloodthirsty, monomaniacal tyrant of a man. That he uh, was installed as security chief of Castro's Cuba, and his first order of business was setting up vast labor camps, or gulags, uh, in which he would send people that were designated to be uh, politically inconvenient or insufficiently committed to the revolution. It turns out those ranks included the likes of gay people, AIDS victims, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, and that violence that he enacted upon his fellow Cubans, he's personally supposed to have either conducted or overseen over a thousand executions, is he was driven by this fixation that comes up a lot in human history of being able to re-engineer man to fit a new political ideal. The idea being that all of us become endowed with certain kind of evolutionarily programmed selfish impulses and it tends, it's, it, they tend to be to prove inconvenient when you're trying to craft a socialist utopia. But he had the bright idea that we could just forcibly change people's programming. And if people failed, 
to get the sufficient like iPhone upgrades to their brains, they get executed or they get sent to labor camps. He eventually was killed in Bolivia uh, about seven years after the Batista regime fell uh, by CIA-backed counter-revolutionaries. Okay, so this was the uh, this is what was going on for quite a while, and and most people I think assumed that the American relationship with Cuba would stay at stasis for the foreseeable future. We embargo them, we attempt to politically and diplomatically marginalize them, and they continue to like uh, not so subtly oppress a lot of their people. But then. After 18 months of secret negotiations, this happened, which is the United States restored full diplomatic relationships with Cuba, and for the first time, a sitting president, Barack Obama, called for a full-scale uh, repeal of the Cuban embargo. So how did we get to that? Cuba was for such a long time considered to be this ideological enemy that was a very close and inconvenient physical proximity. The reason why is because a couple of years ago, Fidel Castro stepped down because of alien health, and this guy took over. This is his brother, Raul Castro. Raul is not endowed with history-making charisma, right? You like, expect to take tax advice from him. You do not expect <laughs> him to instruct you in the ways of revolutionary morals. But he was significantly more practical and a much better manager than his brother was. And he started to invoke, and started to uh, inject some much needed kind of market friendly anti-socialist reforms to the Cuban economy. Where for the last couple of years you've had this emergent middle class there of cab drivers or barbers or locksmiths. These are professions that a decade ago would have been denounced as anti-revolutionary and might have gotten you thrown in jail or exiled from the island. And as a result of sort of this willingness to make certain concessions, it set the groundwork for this breakthrough of the restoration of full diplomatic relationships, where you have the President of the United States shaking hands with the Prime Minister of Cuba. That is a crazy image for uh, your parents and your grandparents. This is not something anyone expected to see in their lifetime. But uh, instructively, in the wake of this decision, which in part is going to allow for a vast flood of new economic activity in Cuba, the response from certain quarters of like the pundit class was revealing about the way that Cuba continues to have, continues to be the sacred fixation that it still seems to represent something that we should yearn for, something that's sort of unpolluted and self-determined in a way that America's not, right? Or in a way that Cancun is not, or some other Latin American country. This is a tweet from, I think just uh, maybe a couple days after the announcement was made in December. This is a Sacramento Bee columnist. It says, as my friend suggests, it's Cuba and it's people who should beware of Pizza Hut, McDonald's, American Idol, and the Kardashians. You have a, a radio host by the name of Matt Binder. Booking my Cuba vacation now before there's a Starbucks and a McDonald's and a bank on every block. Right, because poverty is authentic. This is made doubly ironic by the fact that these guys are using a technology that is banned in the vast majority of Cuba. The internet and Twitter is certainly not allowed. So let me end on this and I'll take some questions. Uh, this is going to be um, probably the singular challenge for you guys as you grow up and go out into the world, which is if a country economically liberalizes, so if they start doing more trade and more thoroughgoing economic interaction with the outside world, will that, necess will that necessitate some serious political reforms? Because right now, Cuba is about to get much richer, 
but there's still that Department of Revolutionary Morals. There's still lots of journalists that are being locked up. And traditionally, the assumption was that if you get people rich, if you get them to be economically self-empowered and autonomous, they're more likely to demand certain democratic reforms. But we've seen with certain countries, <coughs> chiefly China, which is you can get really rich. You can even get Facebook, and you can still be deprived of the vast majority of the political liberties that you're due. That if you land in Beijing and you go to Google something, you can't Google anything. But you're not allowed to Google things in China. And I'm optimistic-ish, but uh, frankly, we don't know anymore. We don't quite know. That's certainly the bet that the Obama administration is making, but uh, time will have to tell. This, by the way, says country or death. Again, powerful, passionate, uh, rhetorical rhetoric. Okay, that's it. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about this or the University of Chicago. Uh, <coughs> hey, go ahead. So, because of the lifting of the economic sanctions, um, it would be reasonable to believe that Cuba would essentially become another Dominican Republic or like resort beach destination versus keeping like um, versus staying isolated. But is that really what like is that really what's going to happen? Looking at it, or will it just um, become an open marketplace? I mean, that's, that's what was happening already. I mean, like certain countries like Britain and Canada have really expansive like hotel operations there, countries that had, had done an economic embargo. I mean, I think there's a good chance it will become resort-like. Uh, and I, there is, all, it will become more homogenized. It will become less distinctive from the rest of Latin America. But it also means that the living standards of the average Cubans will be radically improved, right? So that's the trade-off you get to make. And that it's, there's something ultimately kind of condescending and morally idiotic about rich, rich, rich Westerners complaining about the pure Cuban spirit being polluted, uh, knowing that the policies that they would back would actively deprive average Cubans of a chance at a better life. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, what do you think are some positives or negatives but this, I mean, there are definitely people that are skeptical. I, 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 uh, it's become uh, extremely clear that the embargo did not serve its purpose, which was to choke off Cuba and topple the Castro regime. That didn't work. And what it did actually was provide Castro and some of his allies with an extremely useful rhetorical tool where they could blame the great American menace for the failings of their society. So I think that it was a dead, antiquated policy that should have been rescinded a long time ago. Uh, I'm happy to do it. I mean, I, I generally, my political philosophy is one that is pro-individual liberty. So if people want to put a Bed Bath & Beyond in downtown Havana, like, I'm down. Like, get some fresh sheets, if that's what choices you want to make. I'm much less, I'm, I'm, I'm much more skeptical of sort of top-down like, technocratic solutions that are trying to engineer certain outcomes that one or two people will find particularly compelling. But, I mean, the economic activity with Cuba will be marginal for the United States, but I think it could be a godsend for the locals. Yeah. Uh, yeah, agree. What do you suggest we should have done instead of putting an embargo on the Cuban Uh <coughs> Well, I mean, the, it's like, so just don't do not do that. But it's, I mean, the, the, the period in which it occurred, there really were lots of people that had a lot of power in this country that were convinced that, um, that like, communism was like bird flu. Like, if you don't wash your hands sufficiently, like, your grandkids might catch it, right? And they wanted to keep it as far away from them as possible. And so the idea that you have this, this country that is so close to the American border being infected it just drove them insane. And the kind of natural inclination was to immediately try to um, separate and control. Interestingly, though, it turns out the night before JFK signed into law the embargo, he told one of his like, lower-level functionaries to go and purchase as many Cuban cigars as possible. 
So he had like a stash of like 17,000 that he smoked on during the course of his presidency. So now I think that there's never been a case, well, I don't know. It's a tough question. Uh, generally, I think isolating people that you ideologically disagree with uh, is not a good idea. Last time I was here, I talked about North Korea. Right? And there are certain choices that could have been made to make the United States slightly more engaged with North Korea, which they decided not to do, and that allowed for the inculcation of this very kind of radical ideology that now controls that country. It's right behind you. Yeah. Um, where do you see Cuba being economically in like 30 or 40 years out? Yeah, I mean, it's much better. It's got a long way to grow. It's not going to be an economic power. It's again, it's tiny. It's tiny, but it's like any of those other resort tropical islands where there's just a vast class of people that make a reasonable living, mostly in the surface economy, oftentimes at, at hotels that rich white Westerners visit. Right? It's not. It's better than the alternative. Yeah. Um. So you said Raúl Castro is much more practical uh, leader of Cuba but there's still 20,000 people trying to flee the country. Are people of Cuba in favor of him as a dictator of Fidel, or? Uh, I think they've soured on the Castro regime. Entirely. He actually, they already have, um, they've already designated the next person that's gonna win the elections, and it's not gonna be a Castro, which will represent the first time that Cuba in, you know, over 60 years have not been ruled by some, a member of that family. But by all accounts, again, it, it might not shock you to learn that it's difficult for people to openly acknowledge uh, their critical views of the, the existing regime. Yeah? Uh, when is the next election? Uh, it's in a couple of years. Uh, it'll be soon. He's old. If you one or two more questions, or I can let you guys go home. Maybe I should have given you that option. <laughs> do one more question? I'll do one more, yeah. Sarah. How do you expect the, this will affect the flow of illegal immigrants into the U.S., or will it? So, I mean, they've already now started installing proper diplomatic, proper channels for people to, to travel to the United States. So my assumption is that it will go, it'll go down. Um, we actually have a special classification of green cards that we just allocate to Cubans, and I think one of like the sub policies of restoring diplomatic relations with the country was to expand that number. So, ideally, that would that, that would increase that. Yeah. And people are less likely to flee if it's not a horrifically poor destitute country. Yeah. How big of a mistake do you think was our relationship with the Bautista uh, regime? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to make it clear. Because a lot of people, when they criticize Cuba that also have profound moral blind spots for some of like the really gangster things that the American government has done in the last, you know, well, since since our conception. Like Henry Kissinger is like a straight up war criminal. He's a really bad dude. Um, he seems like a charming uncle now, but that dude conducted like illegal bombing campaigns that killed lots and lots of uh, um, lots and lots of innocent people. So I. Uh, but it's easy for us to say now that it, the, the hype related to the resistance of communism was overblown. So I mean, I, yes, uh, I, I think I've forgot your question. I, I wouldn't have done it, and I think that there, it, it is still something that we have yet to fully morally account for, is how much support the United States has given to various horrific human rights abusers in the last, particularly during the course of the Cold War. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you very much. For your time.